I'm Garrett Wynn Davis, and I'm in good company with Don Greenhouse. Hi, Don. Hi, dear. It's great to see you again. We go back so many years. We are starting next week with our opening week that would have been. It was going to be an homage to the original opening back in 1953, with the opening of the Tom Patterson Theatre, the new one, with Richard III and all as well that ends well. But back in 1953, it was a different world, and not many people are on this interview who were actually there in the company in 1953. Don, could you please tell me, tell us the, the feeling and what that experience was like? I was auditioned by Tony Guthrie at Montreal High. My drama teacher was Eleanor Stewart, who was a part of the company in 53. And so she introduced me to Tony and he interviewed me and then said, well, you've got a good speaking job with a few swear words in there, as he always used. And um, so you're hired. So off I went. And so at 19, you're in Montreal doing some stuff, living at home with, with mom. And yeah, I hadn't seen my parents for four years. Okay. They were stuck in communist China. I was on my own. And I did not see them until the end of the season when they were finally wow. released. Where did you grow up, Don? I grew up in Shanghai. Do you see that right there? It's a, it's a conversation stopper. You go, what? Oh, okay. I went back to Britain after the war just for a little while, and my parents st uh, stuck me in boarding school for a bit. Then I got out of there and back to Shanghai. And the, uh, the, the teacher there at um, the boarding school introducing me to the rest of the students said, and this is Dawn Greenhouse, who comes from the wickedest city on this earth. Can you believe it? That's, what, that's how she introduced me. Shanghai. So I got into quite a bit of trouble. I was always being told I was cheeky. Cheeky. <laughs> Well, cheeky. Yes. You're an actress. Come on. But, Give me a right. Come on, that's what I'm supposed to do. What about your kids? Are they perfect? No, they're a bit cheeky too. <laughs> <laughs> they're all a bit cheeky, yes. <laughs> so the apple in the tree, it's all. But they all have a good sense of humor, which is great. Yes. Uh, the most important thing ever. Yeah. What were your mom and dad doing? My dad was an engineer. So a British engineer over in Shanghai. That's right. And how long were you there then? Many years, I would think. I left when I was uh, 15, just nearly getting on to 16. So how did that inform you? I mean, do you still have things channeled from your Shanghai times? One of the most interesting things, I think one of the reasons why I wanted to be an actor is because during the Second World War, we were all British. Canadians were then British as well. Americans, Dutch and Belgian, we were all put into camps, into internment camps. And I found that I would hang around all the artists. That's what I thought. I thought that this was interesting. I was nine when I went in and 12 when I came out. And I used to hang around. And the, the most extraordinary thing is that I had my dancing teacher there. And she actually choreographed to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Oh, and got all the people in the camp to act a part of it. My brother was part of it. It was extraordinary. So I, I had all of that experience of being around there. I can sing Beethoven's Fifth Symphony because I sat there and heard it played. A couple of old pianos there and two wonderful uh, pianists, and they'd be playing this so that, you know, for me, that da 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 is like, it's just like, that's, you know, like it's, it's ingrained in my, in my soul. But because of being, of being around the artists, I think that sort of stayed with me. I think that's what I want. I want to be like those people. That's where I belong. That's where I belong. Well, so it was at 15 that you came over to Canada. Is that right? I got, got out of Shanghai. But people were getting out of Shanghai because the communists were about to arrive. My father stayed because he was an engineer and working for the waterworks. Owned, the utility companies were all owned by foreigners we were called foreigners by the British and the Americans or whatever. He stayed there. So I got out and I was supposed to go to England, but I did not want to go to England back again. I wanted to go to the United States. So I hung around and my family happened to know a number of the Flying Tigers. So I got in touch with them when I got to Hong Kong and said, listen, how do I get to the United States? And that's exactly what happened. Lived in Los Angeles for a while. This is in 49. You'd have to leave the country in order to go back in after three months. It's just right. So it just so happened that I, I entered it in Montreal, stayed there for a bit, and I thought, hey, Montreal, this is more like 
Shanghai, it's international. I love it. And not only that, I kept bumping into people from Shanghai. The really? From Montreal. Absolutely. And I thought, oh, my God. Even people that had been in CAM were in Montreal. I mean, Los Angeles, in comparison, was really boring at that time in 49. I mean, all right, come on, you know. But Montreal. And so I decided I'm staying in Montreal. That's it. I'm not going back to the United States. I'm staying in Montreal. I love it. Wow. Yeah, and I was there for, it was four years before I saw my parents. The principal of Montreal High took pity on me. She got funding from the, whatever it was called, the Daughters of the Empire or something or other or whatever, and um, which gave me some money to live off. And then when school was over at 2.30, I'd run down to Eaton's and see what I could do so I could make my own living. Okay, so you're 19, you're in uh, Montreal, you're going to go to your first, I suppose, full-time professional gig in Stratford. You know, they were building the tent at that time. Even while you were rehearsing, yes? Oh yeah, the tent was not up yet. So we were rehearsing elsewhere. So there were two plays in the first season and you were in both of them. No, I wasn't in Richard. Being a woman, there weren't as many parts, right? I mean, the actor that I played in Hamlet, at high school, Montreal High, I was Gertrude in my Hamlet was Richard Easton. Now Richard oh. was in the first season, but he got to play a lot of stuff. Wow, okay. You've got four children, three are women, one is a gentleman. They've all touched upon uh, theater in their lives or film or television. Exactly, because my, you know, my husband, my ex-husband, Ted Follows, is also an actor. I mean, they were watching productions at Stratford sitting out up there, uh, from the time they were just, what, three, four years old? Right. Now, where did you and Ted meet? With Canadian players. So not here, not at Stratford. We had met doing some television stuff, but we actually got together with Canadian players. So you and Ted had one of the great love stories of Canadian theatre during that time. But it certainly got a lot of publicity. Yes. I mean, I do have actually still have... Uh, Newspaper clippings of it all. I mean, it was you made a big deal. Actors get married at Stratford, and you know Christopher Plummer and Tammy Grimes. They were in it. I remember Jason Robards and all sorts of people in the company that were yeah. Well, when you did Antony and Cleopatra, when Chris played Antony, yes, yes, and so Caldwell played. But uh, I think you understudied uh, so Caldwell as I did. I did and played Charmin. What are your re recollections of people like, did Bill Shatner, was he there in your first, oh, yes, when you were no. here originally? Oh, I know. I used to hang around a lot with the um, with the older actors. I used to find that they were just fascinating. The only problem with that was it got me drinking a lot, and that wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> but I honestly, I think they made livers better back then. But the theater was open all night. I mean, you could stay in that theater all night. You didn't have to get out of there. So the people would just stay in the theater, you know, when it was built, stay in the theater for God knows how long. And I would be able to go out on the stage and practice and do all sorts of things when they <sighs> were down. Yeah. Right. That's fantastic. Did you have a group that you had a sort of a little group that you hung with? Dougie was a big influence on me, <laughs> Dougie Campbell. Yes. And uh, it was because of Dougie that, that I was hired for Canadian players. And one of the great theater men in our history. Exactly, yeah. I still think the Canadian Players is one of the great things that, that happened outside the two festivals, outside the Stratford Shaw festivals and the new theaters that started Soul Pepper and things like that. I think Canadian Players was one of the great theater companies of our country. Well, when you consider that we toured the entire continent by bus, sometimes we had to, we had to go by plane to get to where we were. But we did this all in a big bus. We're traveling wow. all day and then get off the bus and then go into the hotel and, and part of the crew were also the actors who set up the uh, the thing and we didn't know, never knew where we were going to play, whether it was going to be in a huge auditorium in one of the universities or on some sort of an old movie set where you could hardly even move. I mean, you had no idea. So we had to learn how to project to a great big, huge auditorium, like a Duke's wow. University or whatever. Yeah. And did you ever tour with the festival, with the Stratford Festival? Yes. I did. Uh, where would you go? Australia. Oh, that's exciting. And we were known as the National Canadian Theatre. I think that's the way that they, they called the company. 
what was it like being a woman in the beginning of the festival in terms of not roles necessarily, <laughs> but in terms of, you know, we, you know, we've had series like Mad Men on and things like that about all this time. What was it like being a woman in, in, a, in, in something that was starting from grassroots and building that up? You know, I mean, it was frustrating not to be able to play a part, but then I sort of accepted that because there were not that many parts for women in Shakespeare. And the women that did play in it were great and very talented. I think the most wonderful thing was to have the opportunity to watch Irene Worth, who was so brilliant. Camaraderie with your male actors, was there an, an even keel? Was everybody on the same playing field? Was there were, was everybody on par? Did you feel like a respect as a woman with the uh, guys? No, I think that, you know, the, there was a difference between the ones that had that were players and acted oh. and the rest of us that were hanging around and just playing bits and pieces. There was a distinction. But um, I'm an, I managed to, get, to somehow infiltrate that and hang around with a lot of, with Dougie and Max and whatever, and Eric House. It was a, really Eric oh. House that got me in there. Eric House, another, oh, I still love Eric. There is something about apprenticeship and journeyman and working your way up that I think is beneficial for a player. I think that the desire and the ambition and things like that is all very good. But I think there's also something about watching and learning and aspiring that is, I think, uh, one of the best things that can lead to confidence and humility, which I think sometimes it's a nice uh, part to have playing in one of your ears occasionally is a little humility as opposed to get out of my way. I'm the only thing that's worth watching. So there's something nice about the building a career as opposed to. You're banging. very wise. You're absolutely right about that. But it's less and less and less. Uh, as time goes on. And I think that's something sad that we miss. But I think the excitement of starting something new, was that palpable? Oh, extraordinary to be part of that. And the town was on board? Oh, it was know? just, yeah, it was, for Canada, it was a huge, yeah. you know, deal. It was, yeah, very exciting. Through your career, you've had such amazing success and variety. I'm sure one of the highlights was me uh, playing your son. You played my mother in a great motion picture <laughs> called Deadly Harvest. I ended up being edited as if I shot you in that movie, and I never did. So I apologize, and I hope you're feeling better. But, um, <laughs> but so you, you always combined a lot of uh, film and uh, television and, and uh, theater along the way. What's a major sacrifice in having a career? a uh, husband who's got a very uh, active career and four beautiful children who also you know have careers in, in many different things what's a, what's a sacrifice for you throughout that or is there i don't know there was much of a sacrifice if anybody suffered i guess it was the kids maybe because mommy and daddy would be away a lot because you've always done it the theater and the world of entertainment that and children that's right that's it now, you That's know, in, in, in my early days, when I had to make a buck in order to survive, I knew how to do shorthand and typing. So, oh. that, so that, that I learned how to do that. I dropped out of school and started to do that. And that helped me out because it meant that when I went to Hong Kong, I could get a job. Okay, okay, that's good. Because I could do the shorthand typing. So I could always do that to compliment because I was never making enough money as an actor. So there I could also do that as well. I want to know, can you, are you good at texting now? Yeah, I know I'm not actually, no. not that good at all though. If there was something about Don Greenhouse that one wanted to know that you might not know. In 1970, Nathan Cohen had an article in this style or whatever, and he named the best six performers of the 60s. Like, there were four men, and I can only remember of the two men Bill Hart and Jean Gascon. I think the other two were from Quebec. And two women, Franny Highland and me, Dawn Greenhouse. Yay. Oh, that one. That's good company. Yeah. Well, I can say something uh, for me. I, I was, uh, Franny played my mom in a uh, an old coward thing called the vor Vortex. Ah, yes. And and I inadvertently broke Franny's rib during a scene once. So I'm not a good trusting son, I don't think. I'd shoot you. I break Franny's rib. I wouldn't hang around with me. 
as a kid. No, but isn't that wonderful when you when we say, you know, because I think of Don Greenhouse, I think of Frank Highland, I think of Pat Galloway, I think of Pat Collins, I think, I mean, such such a great list of of actors and actresses who have who've who've graced our stages over the years. It's magnificent. I was just chatting with Len Carew. Uh, oh, week. gosh, yeah. And Len's doing great. And, you know, just talking about the folks that, I, and I'm lucky enough to be, just to have known you guys. Um, wow. It's just a big wow. I hope that our uh, kids and stuff have a wow in their lives. Because there's a, there's a big wow when we get a, a chance to work with you guys and spend time with you guys. That's a wow for me. History is a wow for me. Um, and I hope that continues, where we can pass down the wow factor of history, the, theatrically and every kind of history, but theatrically. It's so... It's such a joy. Wow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How do you feel about going forward? How do you feel about, I mean, there's a past, there's a present, there's a future, et cetera. But how do you feel about the present having been an actor your whole life and, and the, what's ahead? As you get older, it's it, it's difficult. I mean, not that you're not capable of doing it, but I think, yeah, it's just, yeah, harder to get roles. So would you still, if you had more opportunity? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I think it's just one of those things that you, when you spent so much of your life be, being an actress, I mean, in, in, in that ex whole experience of sharing and exposing yourself, it's something that, and there's so much a part of you and your soul that you, you, you never get over it. You know what I mean? So it's, in, in many ways, yeah, I miss it. And how are you um, dealing with this new uh, reality that we're in at this time? Just dealing with it, I guess. I'm very lucky in that I'm looked after by my kids. I've got um, Megan here who does everything for me and nags a lot, you know, get out and walk a bit and this and that. And no, you can't have any more than three cigarettes a day. I'll tell you, Don, this is a treat. And I can't thank you enough for taking some time to say hi. Well, I can't thank you enough for acknowledging me and having this conversation. So this is Gar saying thank you for joining us and joining me, who's in very good company with Don Greenhouse. Thanks, Don. You're most welcome.